welcome everybody. We are excited to conclude our annual symposium week, which uh, celebrates Constitution Day and Citizenship Day every year with a keynote conversation today with Dr. Chris Bale and uh, interviewed by our rock star, um, former journalist, Lou Hanessian. And so we're so excited for this conversation. Um, I think everybody knows that the theme of this week has been depolarization. And we've looked at that from various lenses, mainly various voices out there, whether it was the veteran community and what role they played in leading that, uh, the role of women in depolarization. We looked at the role of immigrant voices, of students and faculty on college campuses. We looked at the role of the media. And so what better way to conclude uh, this week of exploration in this space with exploring the role of social media and maybe our role in it. And so I'm really excited for this conversation. We have, uh, number one, I wanna thank everybody for joining us, both uh, the live audience as well as uh, the audience who will watch it after it's produced and up on our YouTube channel. I wanna thank our volunteers who we could not do our programming without our volunteers. And we're so grateful um, for all the support they provide, whether it's tech support, which uh, we're getting uh, during all of our programming virtually, or interviews or uh, all the other ways that our volunteers support us. For our sponsors, thank you so much for uh, making this week possible. We've had just some amazing sponsors, FIRE, Veterans for American Ideals, Ursula Inc., who have stepped up and really supported us in order to bring this programming to you all. And lastly, I'd wanna thank our members who are the lifeblood of our organization. They are the people who are civically engaged out there in their communities and are at many times working along issues of polarization and how do they bridge divides in our communities. So I think you're in for a special treat with this, uh, this conversation. I would be remiss if I didn't mention our previous programming is already up on our YouTube channel. So you can go there if you wanna get notified when this program or others um, get produced and put up, just click subscribe on our YouTube channel and you'll automatically get notified. Um, our moderator today is Lou Hanassian, who is not only a former uh, NBC anchor and professional journalist, but she has spent the last decade exploring neuroscience and particularly uh, the intersection of it with the media landscape. And so who better than to facilitate this conversation? So I'm just so grateful for you being here today, Lou. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I'm absolutely thrilled. Thank you so much, Steve. All right, let's kick things off. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our very special guest today. Uh, this brilliant guest we have, we're so fortunate to um, that he said yes, that he is available to talk with us. So Chris Bale, is Professor of Sociology and Public Policy at Duke University, where he directs the Polarization Lab. He studies political tribalism, extremism, and social psychology using data from social media and tools from the emerging field of computational social science. He received his PhD from Harvard University in 2011. His new book is Breaking the Social Media Prism, How to Make Our Platforms less polarizing. Chris Bale, thank you so much for being here. We are just so thank thrilled. You. Thank uh, you so much for having me, thanks. Yeah, and for offering us a new lens on polarization. We have so much to get to in the next hour. The way we'll do this, just for the people who have joined us is, uh, Chris and I will talk for a few minutes um, off the top and I will ask him some questions based on the book. And then we really want to incorporate your questions. So I will be checking with the people working behind the scenes, which questions are there. We'll weave them throughout and or we will bring them in at the end. But towards the end of, uh, of the interview today, Chris is going to share some really practical tools. So there's science here and then there is the how do we apply the science. So I'm very excited. So Chris, okay. So this book, which I read cover to cover, um, it really changed the way I think about polarization, and I dare say it changed the way I think about reality, because I realized that you are really delineating a gap between our perceptions of what we think is polarizing 
and, and the reality of that. So what, why don't we start there? Why don't we start with um, how does social media shape who we think we are and who we think other people are? That's the hundred million dollar question, Lou. Um, you know, we, we tend to think of social media as just a place where we go to get information or maybe to entertain ourselves for a few minutes. But really, I think it's doing something deeper to us. It's kindling something deep inside you know, human nature, which is to try to read people around us, to get clues about which kinds of identities that we might present to others are working, which kinds of, which kinds of identities give us status and, and make us feel good about ourselves. And when you start to think about social media through that lens, it illuminates a wholly different set of concerns. Wow. So I heard you say, and you write in the book, that social media may have been designed or intended um, to be a marketplace of ideas, but it's clear that it's become a competition of identities. And so you talk a lot about how we look for membership in social groups and an easy social group, right, is political parties. And I know this predates social media, this sort of search for, for esteem and status in membership, but talk to us a little bit about this idea of uh, competition of identities and where this is where the trouble brews. Am I correct? That's right. That's right. You know, everybody, you know, years ago, many of us were hoping that social media would improve democracy, right? It would allow us to have more informed conversations with a more representative group of people and that the truth would almost kind of rise up almost naturally through the nature of the system. And that would be true if we were all kind of logging on social media to find political compromise. But I think what's happened, especially in recent years, is that social media has just become you know, a playing field for partisan warfare. And so the typical experience of most people when they log on to social media and discuss politics is not a high level conversation where you find political compromise, no. The, you know, the, the most common experience is that you see some extreme message by the small group of users of social media that produce the vast majority of messages. And so really you started to talk in your intro about the gap between um, social media and reality. Mm -hmm. And when we, become to, when we begin to misunderstand those extreme people as representative of the other side, that's where things really start to break down. But I guess the thing you really wrote so convincingly about in the book was how unaware we are of it. So exactly. let's, let's, let's talk about echo chambers for a moment because I think this will, this will bring us into that more deeply. Uh, so tell us what echo chambers are. I mean, they certainly are not new. They've been around for decades, which I thought was an interesting fact. But tell us about, um, tell us about this line you say in the book, this common wisdom about social media, echo chambers, and political polarization may not only be wrong, but counterproductive. So that, I think that's such a, such a, a, a powerful statement, but why don't you tell us what echo chambers are and then unpack that a bit. Sure. Yeah. So I think many of us have heard this idea that social media has encouraged us to self-segregate according to, according to our political views. And so what that does, many people think, is it just continues to expose us to the same type of information. We don't see other perspectives. And inevitably, we become hardened in our views and less capable of compromise, and we begin to dehumanize the other side. Now, um, when you said this is surprising, you know, it actually surprised me too. In fact, uh, when I began the research uh, for this book about five years ago, I set out to try to take people out of their echo chambers to see what would happen. Um, so we, in, in, in my research group, the Polarization Lab, we recruited about 1,200 Republicans and Democrats who use Twitter. And then um, we asked them to complete a survey about what they thought about politics. But then the, the sort of interesting thing we did is we paid half of them to follow bots or automated Twitter accounts that retweeted messages from the other side. So Democrats saw messages from Republican elected officials, journalists, advocacy groups, and, and so on. And Democrats saw the same type of messages from Republicans for one month. Now, of course, what we hoped would happen is that that type of exposure to the other side, taking people outside the echo chambers that we think, or many people think are insulating them from the other side, 
uh, would make them more moderate. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, that's not what we saw. Um, nobody really became more moderate. Most people, and uh, particularly Republicans in the study, tended to become more extreme in their views. So when we exposed Democrats to Republicans, they became more liberal, not more moderate. And when we uh, exposed Republicans to Democrats, they tended to become substantially more conservative. So, wow. I mean, that really brings up so many questions, right? And if you have any questions, um, if you're listening, please pop them into the Q&A because we really want to be able to interact um, with you. So is it, is it as simplistic and base as saying it just feels good to be right? I mean, is it as, as, as basic as saying that we are so entrenched in the craving for status as a kind of survival, identity survival, um, that, that it actually fuels an inaccurate appraisal of, of identity, of, of even our own opinions. And then you, you add the unawareness to that and, and we have a, a mess. I mean, you say this research is messy, but that all this deceptive uh, perception of what we think we believe is really a mess. So how did you pull it apart? How did you disentangle it? Sure. So, you know, the first thing, of course, we wanted to look at this from every angle. We were surprised. Lots of people were surprised. And so we spent a lot of time using the latest advances in artificial intelligence, the latest tools from data science, sifting through millions of tweets and, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of data points. And we really couldn't find the answer. It was a pretty humbling experience, to be honest. And, you know, for someone who set out to, to you know, mitigate polarization and only increase polarization, this is, this is pretty bad news. So we quickly got back to work. And what we did in a follow-up study is instead of doing this large uh, study with thousands of people, we got a much smaller group of people who we could talk to before, during, and after. They did the same type of experiment. So we got to kind of meet people where they were at and hear their stories. And, you know, I'll just maybe share one of those stories with you. Sure. Um, uh, one that sticks with me in particular. Um, so uh, there's a woman I call in the book, Patty. That's not her real name to, to protect her identity. But um, Patty is a, about a 63 year old woman. She lives in upstate New York. Um, you know, her, her family is a farming family. Um, they kind of fell on hard times. Her husband had a pre-existing condition. They got some medical bills. And, you know, when we first met her and, and talked to her, our research team, you know, the thing that was immediately clear is she just didn't like politics. You know, she didn't want any of it. You know, she didn't want it. You know, she, she turned on Fox News and just get repulsed by, you know, all the incivility. But then she'd also turn on CNN and say, you know, well, that, that Don Lemon guy is also a little biased too. And, you know, I don't like that either. Um, and, you know, the more we started to talk to her, she, we finally kind of got out of her that, yeah, she, she kind of leans Democrat. She's, mo you know, modestly Democrat. But she had a lot of views that were in line with Republican orthodoxy. For example, she was frustrated about taxes, particularly in her local area. Um, she had, you know, somewhat, um, you know, um, negative views about um, some of the immigration policy that was then being promoted by the left. Um, you know, she, in other words, she seemed like the type of disaffected liberal for whom uh, Trump style kind of populism might really appeal. And so we thought that as we began to turn up the, the number of messages in her feed from Republican, um, Republican Twitter users, these are again, high profile Twitter users like politicians and journalists and so on, that we would see her gradually move to the right and say, you know, these Republicans have some good ideas, you know. Instead, the opposite happened once again. And gradually we saw Patty not only, um, you know, start to engage in politics, which was itself surprising, but eventually getting into arguments about politics with the other side. And when we step back to look at what happened, you know, we noticed that what Patty was seeing was not the type of high quality messaging you might see coming out of um, First Amendment voice, you know, um, really, you know, trying to bridge, um, bridge political divides, right? That's not what happens on, on Twitter or Facebook, right? What we see is partisan warfare. So when you expose people to the other side, you're simply turning up the volume of incivility. And what that does at a, at a social psychological level, we think, is it activates that partisan identity, even among people like Patty who didn't really have it before. And then once they feel attacked, um, they dive right in, right? It's, uh, it's contagious, the, the structure, the incentive structure of social media, 
is to win, as, as you were saying earlier, and take down the other side. So there's a lot of examples like this. Um, other people on the Republican side we saw doing the same thing, people with strong political views, people with modest political views. And we think that, yeah, it's because social media has really become a competition of our identities and not a competition of our ideas. And I, it strikes me when you talk about how um, she's a, when, when they feel attacked, when she felt attacked, you know, I think about this from a brain point of view and how there's like a neural feedback loop uh, because then we come to expect being attacked. And then I log on to expect being attacked. It's almost like um, these this um, entrenched identity um, focus almost becomes the the wall that people put up to prevent them from discussing ideas. So let's move yeah. to this idea of a prism um, because I was so struck by how you came to this metaphor. Um, people talk about the mirror, they talk about the looking glass, they talk about um, you know various other metaphors when it comes to polarization. But you bring up this idea of a prism which I thought was so masterfully done. So take us into what the prism is and why this struck you this way. Thanks. Yeah. You know, um, one thing that I think makes us uniquely human is, again, that we care so much what other people think about us. You know, we we're constantly looking around for evidence um, of, of what's working for us, what's making, you know, what's giving us status and so on. So, you know, we're hardwired to do this, I think. And, and again, a lot of it's subconscious. A lot of it happens. You know, we don't we don't even know we're doing it. Um, you can see it in kids more than you can see it in adults because kids are really still working things out and vocalize them a lot more. But by the time you're an adult, you're still doing it. You're just not aware of it. Mm -hmm. But we are hardwired to do this in a situation where, you know, we're hunter gatherers on a plane where we can like see everybody around us and see their facial expressions and talk to them and understand, you know, where they're coming from. And, and we can tell them where we're, we're coming from online. It's profoundly different, right? There's mm -hmm. two critical differences. The first one is, we have a much broader palette of, of identities to experiment with, if you like. You know, we can, online, we can be virtually anyone, right? I could be fully anonymous and pretend to be someone, someone totally different, or I could tell you every detail down to what I had for breakfast, right? And everything <laughs> in between. So we're kind of like, you know, constantly um, trying on these different hats. So that's the one thing, we have more, more flexibility. The other thing though, and this is where uh, the technology comes in, is we have powerful new tools to monitor what other people are thinking about us, you know, follower counts, likes, engagement metrics, analytics, right? And, you know, when we make a post, um, I think, you know, again, often subconsciously, you know, we're thinking, oh, this got a lot of likes and, you know, this didn't. And what we see when we begin to put people into laboratory studies, when we have them use social media is there's a, it's, it's, you know, it's, I'm not going to say it's like a rat hitting a, 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 you know, a water bottle for a pellet or some kind of Pavlovian reaction. It might not, might not be that deep, but we do see that once you get that like, it tends to encourage more of the behavior that got the like. So the really important question is, is that signal we're getting from other people representative of everyone? Or is it in, in kind of like a mirror that we can use to look at all of society? Or is it more like a prism that's actually refracting certain parts of our social setting and not others? And, and I think it's very much the latter, that we're getting a very distorted view. And that explains the lion's share of polarization on our platforms. Yeah, so that's why you say prism, the prism drives extremism. So when you add these distortions to a platform where people are, as you say, it's not as simple anymore as people seeking entertainment or connection. And so now we have people who without awareness, um, seeking dopamine, see, seeking that hit, that like, um, which becomes a distorted sense of validation, a distorted sense of civic engagement. Um, but the prism is invisible, which is one of the challenges that you say we have before us. And so we, you say we need to have an experience that reveals it. So I think this is the crux of why your book um, isn't uh, just this theoretical construct, but this, hey, this is what we've seen. You are not afraid to say, we were surprised. We thought it could be this and it really wasn't that. So, um, Comment on that, and then I'd love to ask you how research shows now, the research you've done, is that making people aware of these misperceptions, of these distortions, actually is what has a depolarizing effect. 
This will that's be right. Yeah. That's right. Let's get to the good news because I've, I've given you so much bad news already, right? Yeah. I would love to have told you that, you know, we can just ask Facebook to fix our echo chambers or we can just ask Twitter to, you know, tweak its algorithm a little bit and this is all going to go away. Um, right. But because this is so hardwired in us, mm -hmm. I don't see a solution where we social media users ourselves don't collectively have to change our behavior in order to, to, to begin to push back against polarization. Now I realize that's asking a lot of people, you know, a lot of people don't think of social media as like work, you know, and you, you go out, you log on there for a few minutes, you know, a few minutes to off or, or to, to take a break, right? Um, but I think, you know, what we need is more reflective social media users. We need to teach people, first of all, to see this social media prism. So the first thing we need to do is educate people about the scale of, of, of how much distortion there is. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, 6% of Twitter users, you know, make up about three quarters of all tweets about politics. And that 6% of Twitter users has very extreme views. So, you know, each time you log on again, if you're, if you're seeing a political message from the other side, there's a high probability that it's going to be an extreme message. And where the prism comes in and seeing the prism is if you begin to misunderstand that person from the other side as typical of the other side, that's where we get this distortion. And, you know, it's something that we, we, we social scientists, social psychologists and, and sociologists and political scientists have come to call false polarization. Mm -hmm. You know, the good news here is polarization is actually not as bad as we think it is. We all tend to overestimate the ideological extremity of the other side and underestimate the ideological extremity of our own side. And those two things together make us all feel much more polarized than we really are. False polarization has actually been around through the 1980s and 1990s. I know earlier this week, um, this, this conference has talked about the role of the media. And certainly the media had a role to play in, in fomenting polarization, especially probably cable news. But if cable news kind of maybe stoked it a little bit, um, it seems that social media has set it into hyperdrive. You know, we, we really now that anybody can say anything to anyone, um, you know, the conventional, the, the, the high, especially the high integrity journalists like yourselves who could really put things in context for people just aren't there. And so we enter these debates about politics online without any kind of context. And that's the most dangerous thing. So learning to see the prism is, is job number one for all of us. I, I just really hit me what you just said about context, because um, there's an interpreter function on the left side of the brain that in the absence of context, we make things up. And so I was thinking too about the gap. This is what just kept hitting me through the book. You talk about this gap and what do we do as, as wired for storytelling and wired for meaning making and wired for safety, but also wired for threat detection is mm -hmm. we just start filling in the gap with whatever we assume. And then we figure, oh, that's the story. That's and right. then and then threat becomes pervasive where, the, like you just said, that 6% representing 73% um, uh, of, of all posts, um, it's like that objects and mirror appear larger than they really Exactly. Are. Yeah, 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 I like that. <laughs> um, so, so let me, you know, I've, in your book, you mentioned uh, Jared Lanier or Lanier who says, you know, let's just delete all our accounts. And so I, I love how you say that we don't have to delete all, all our accounts. It's probably not realistic. Um, not that you're picking a bone with Jared, but um, um, this idea of understanding that we as we the people can push back against these distortions, against this, uh, this prism effect. Um, is it fair to call it a prism effect? I think I just coined that. Yeah. <laughs> you're saying we can push back. And I think it's interesting because I think and what I'd love to have you invite you into doing now is first that we can push back. We first have to know we can, but then we have to know how, right? Okay. It's almost like this, this um, understanding that we have the capacity and then understanding that it's worth it, understanding what's at stake. So, um, so take us into the polarization lab. Uh, okay, take great. Us to, your, to your lab. Uh, tell us what the polarization lab is, because it just sounds like the coolest place on earth. And um, and then take us into the research and what you what you set up as your premise and, and what the research was. 
Sure. So, um, you know, everyone on the call can can check out polarizationlab.com. I'm just going to share my screen here so you can see it. You know, we are a team at Duke University of um, social scientists and data scientists who uh, who have tried to both, you know, as I've discussed so far, kind of diagnose the root causes of polarization, uh, but then also to really empower social media users to, to um, you know, to counter counteract these forces that we've been talking about. And, and we did this because we realized that none of this is easy, right? It would be easy to write a book that just says, hey, all of you, you know, be more kind, you know, or let's all just be more civil or, you know, let's, and I know that a lot of the people on this call and a lot of the people that, um, you know, come to a conference like this are the type of people who care and who really want to make meaningful difference. Um, but, you know, you're busy. You got you got you got other things to worry about. So we wanted to make it easier for people to see the social media prism and for people to learn how to break themselves out of it. So if you come to our website here and if you go to our tools, you can see what was what's often called middleware. Uh, middleware is kind of like something you use in tandem with a, uh, a social media site or some other kind of technology to try to sort of um, create a different experience. And, you know, many of you are probably frustrated with the, the platforms right now. You don't like something about Facebook, you don't like Twitter, whatever. This is going to help you change it. I'll, I'll give you some examples. So first, let's try to see the prism here. And, you know, there's a few different tools. Uh, maybe we'll start off with our trollometer here. So you know, let's say you want to, um, you're, you're having this, you know, interaction with someone and, and um, you know, you want to know, well, where do their ideas fit in? Is this, is this an extremist who's just out to antagonize me? Or is this a, an, another moderate person who I can really have a productive conversation with? Well, what we've done is study political trolling in the wild for you. Gone out and identified trolls and tracked their behavior, looked at features of trolls. And these apps let you plug in kind of different characteristics, gender, age, how often they're posting, whether they use their real name, and so on. And it gives you an estimate of the likelihood that these people are extremists who might not be worth your time. We also use the latest advances in data science to track the language that trolls are using to help you just learn to, you know, don't feed the trolls, right? That's a good old, good old piece of advice. But the other really important thing here is how is your own behavior contributing to this problem at scale, right? And I love what you said, Lou, about, um, you know, this idea that I think a lot of people feel like, you know, social media is just a mess, right? Why even bother? Why should we, uh, why should we log on to this thing that seems to just be polarizing us? Let me try to explain my, my, my belief here. Um, you know, I, I'm, I, I, I hear you. I, you know, I, I felt that way many times myself, but here's the problem. If well-meaning, civil, moderate people all begin to disengage, it's only going to make this problem worse. And there's a lot of reasons that moderates don't want to engage. I have a whole chapter on this in the book. Why I explain why, you know, yeah, it might upset a family member. It might make your life hard at work. Um, it might complicate relationships with friends, right? Uh, maybe friends with more extreme views than you have. But, you know, if moderates are uh, become kind of invisible on our platforms, that's the root of the problem. And so everybody can do some introspection with our tools. For example, this tool, which we call Tweetiology, it lets you sign into your Twitter account and then get a, uh, a kind of a look at what other people see in your politics. So the way this works is right now, a machine learning model is sifting through all my tweets and comparing them to a variety of elected officials and other journalists and stuff like that to see where I fall on the continuum. So here you can see I'm a little bit left of center according to what I produce on Twitter. Now, the way you use this tool is to kind of say, okay, well, is this an accurate representation of who I really am? So we have other tools on the website that allow you to measure your ide ideology, answer a bunch of questions about your views on different political issues. And then you can compare this score, the online score to the offline score. And that's how you can learn to see the social media prism and, and how it's distorting things. So that's just two of the tools, you know, I'd love to, love to talk about more. Maybe we can, we can circle back and talk about a few others as we go on here, if, if folks on the call have specific uh, questions about some of the tools i'm happy to say more too oh absolutely we will and i loved when you enlarged at the end i think when you come back we'll ask you to do that so sure. uh, this is so fascinating because in essence what you're describing is 
a methodology that invites people to engage with tools to cultivate self-reflection. Exactly. Which is, which is such an abstract thing, right? It's that old, how do you know you're in denial if you're in denial? So, um, so I think that's really very, very significant. So tell us about in the lab, you, you created a platform to be used in the lab, kind of in the lab vacuum, where you invited um, people in to, to this study and you essentially created a new social media platform for the purpose of the study to exist in the lab. And you called it Discuss It. So tell us a little bit about that. What was the purpose of it and what question were you trying to answer? Well, here's a problem I think we're at, where, where, here's a problem we're all facing right now. Um, you know, we were kind of just accepting Facebook and Twitter and Instagram as the only meals on the menu, right? We're saying, oh, what if we tweak this little thing about Facebook or this little thing about Twitter? You know, nobody's stepping back and saying, look, these are platforms that were originally designed to, in the case of Facebook, help Harvard undergraduates rate each other's physical attractiveness. Or in the case of Instagram, you know, a lot of people don't know Instagram was originally called bourbon and was facilitating alcohol-based gatherings, right? Uh, Twitter was a more effective way to message your friends, right? Why should we expect these, these uh, platforms designed for these, you know, really niche purposes to seamlessly evolve into, you know, the, the public forum of democracy around the world? We shouldn't. Instead, we should step back and say, if we could redesign social media from scratch, um, where should we begin? And so we very much wanted to do that. And a, a real challenge for researchers right now, I think for everyone right now, is that, you know, Facebook is, is kind of a closed company, right? We can't go in there and say, hey, Facebook, will you help, you know, we tweak this and that, and then we'll, we'll do this other experiment. We can figure out which, you know, which aspects Facebook are polarizing. Can you try this whole new feature that's not even, they want, you know, they'll laugh you out the door, right? Um, for a lot of different reasons. So we decided the only way to do this, what we think is really vital research is to build our own social media platform. And what we wanted to do was put real people on it and be able to pull different levers, turn on and off different features that research, previous research had suggested might be useful in depolarizing people. And here's where some really good news is coming in. Um, you know, what we've discovered um, is that, what, again, what we need to do is teach people to put their ideas before their identities, to try to, you know, frame interactions, not as contests about whose side is winning, um, but about the content of the ideas themselves. And so, a lot of people, you know, when they think about anonymity, they think that's a bad thing, right? They, you know, I tell a story in the book about a guy who's an anonymous troll that does some of the worst, you know, worst stuff I've ever seen on the internet. Um, on the other hand, anonymity has an underappreciated feature, and that is that it allows people to explore unpopular ideas outside the peer pressure of the other side or their own side, right? So if you're a Democrat, say, with concerns about defunding the police, you know, it, it's, it, you're not gonna feel super comfortable posting about that, you know, kind of moderate view on Twitter, right? Why? Because you might get attacked by your own side, you might get attacked by the other side, why even bother, right? But if we put people in anonymous discussions, since so we had, we did this experiment, we recruited a, a large group of people to install the platform. We gave it that generic name, discuss it, because we didn't want only the type of people who care about politics to come on. We wanted to see what happened if you brought, you know, large swaths of the population on. Right. And then we asked them, you know, either questions about immigration or gun control. And then our system matched them with one other user. Unbeknownst to the research participant, that other user was a member of the other side. And then we just had them have a pretty quick conversation online, uh, probably less than an hour for most people. And what we discovered is significant drops in polarization among everyone who did this, especially Republicans. Um, but also Democrats. And, um, you know, even, you know, I've read through all the ch transcripts of this conversation. I mean, just amazing stuff, like people starting a, a grassroots movement to prevent uh, suicide with firearms, you know? I mean, like really, you know, finding common ground, even, even connecting in other ways after the study, we had people asking us, well, how do I, you know, how do I keep using this, this new platform? You know, it's so great. Um, unfortunately, we haven't, you know, we haven't actually been able to make the platform um, publicly available. That takes a lot more resources than we have right now, though that's our ambition to do that. So yeah, anonymity, somewhat counterintuitively, when properly cultivated, 
And when you control the environment in ways that kind of incentivize that kind of moderation, seems to really work, um, at least in this first study. So I'm really curious about the idea that you noticed that it had a depolarizing effect. Um, did you notice in the transcripts that not only was there more curiosity or perhaps maybe let me ask it this way in the transcripts did you notice that was that there was less polarization but also because there was more curiosity or did you notice or were you tracking for self-reflection did anybody say oh i didn't realize or did you did you read language that lent itself to an increased sense of awareness Oh yeah, I mean, time and again, people we saw people saying, "I didn't know any Democrats thought that way," you know, "I didn't know any Democrats own guns," or "I didn't know any Republicans," you know, like like you know, in this conference, we have seen a number of Republicans who are supporting immigrants and, and refugees in different ways, and a lot of Democrats were like, "Wait a minute, all Republicans hate immigrants?" Not true, right? That kind of again, correcting the misperception. You know, one of the really exciting things, um, you know, going beyond our study for a moment is that research across different places, different countries, different time periods is really becoming clear. If we can correct those misperceptions, attitudes improve almost instantly. It's, it's really a, a, an amazing thing. So, you know, anything we can do to, to kind of um, stem the tide of misperception um, is, is gonna be really valuable in, in, in the solution space. It's huge. And we have a few questions coming, which I wanna to get to in a second. I think what's so interesting is that this corrective process, right? So it's like context sensitivity and this feedback piece, but it's the willingness to be corrected. I think that's what's so interesting um, that came up for me when I was reading about the results of the research, thinking that defense piece that's typically there, that wall that, that goes up in whatever we would think of as the echo chambers, it seems that you've created a platform um, upon which people's defenses can be softened such that they can make that connection. Oh, I didn't know Democrats thought that, but not snap back into their position of entrenchment, but in fact go, I'm more curious now, I'm coming forward. So that's so interesting to me. Um, let me just wrap my questions for you here and then bring in uh, questions from our audience. I, I just think, Chris, you know, you as a computational social scientist who works with data are so human in your approach. You have really done what I think is quite a rare thing where you reconcile, you know, what is human about us um, with the data, which, which just taken apart doesn't, doesn't say anything about the nuances of who we are and brought them together. So I, I think we really all have a deep curiosity now about computational social science, but also about you and your work. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. That, that really means a lot. You know, I, I really appreciate that. Awesome. All right. So questions here. Uh, so we have uh, from David, has the use and misuse through passing information of social media by elected officials gotten worse in recent years, do you think? And what impact has it had on partisanship and representative democracy? Great question. You know, uh, this, is, this is another surprising one. Um, you know, a lot of what I try to do in this new book is to kind of do some myth busting. We already talked about the echo chamber, how the echo chamber might, might not be quite what we think it is. Um, misinformation is another area where um, the uh, re now the research is new, it's only you know four or five, six years old on social media, anyways. And the, the number one finding we see is that you know the scale of misinformation is, is a lot smaller than most people realize. So let's go back to the 2016 election. Um, one study estimates less than two percent of Twitter users saw any misinformation. Another study says that, that um, you know most people only saw and remembered one or less pieces of misinformation. And so the overall scale is, is not quite as bad as we might think. You see some reports, um, there's a lot of uncareful data analysis that goes on, particularly um, misreading Facebook data, especially. So the first thing we need to know is the scale is maybe not as bad as, as, as you might think from following what's going on, on online. Um, now, you can still say, okay, fine, but 2% of Twitter is still a ton of people, right? That's a huge number of people and a little bit of misinformation could do a lot of damage. Absolutely, I agree. And, you know, we were so convinced of that, in fact, that we decided to run a study where working with data from Twitter, we were able to look at people who interacted with Russian bot accounts um, or troll accounts uh, around 2017. 
And we had survey data with them before and after these interactions. And we were able to try to see, is there any evidence that the people who were you know, antagonized by the trolls really got more polarized? What we saw is there's no difference. Um, the trolls really didn't seem to have a big effect. And here's why. Um, they tended to only interact with people who were deep inside echo chambers whose views were already so strong that they couldn't become more polarized. So that's kind of good news in a way. The echo chamber was, you know, um, insulating us from the bad stuff, right? Um, but it also throws into question this, this broader public narrative, like, oh, all we need is for Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram to do a better job weeding out misinformation, then we'll all be fine, right? I think the problem is, you know, we're, we're always going to have misinformation. We can't content moderate our way out of this, much as I would like to tell you, I think we can. But we are so focused on the bad actors, the small, tiny group that causes all the problems. And most of the data and most of the evidence suggests anything we try to do is either ineffective or maybe even counterproductive. And we've spent so much less time focused on the, the positive side. So just to wrap up the answer to the question, the question is, is it getting worse? Um, you know, it's hard to say. It depends on issues. COVID has changed a lot. Um, yeah. We don't yet have a lot of good studies of COVID misinformation. Those are coming out now. Some of those are, are dovetailing with the earlier research I described. Um, you know, certainly at some level, it's having a corrosive effect on democracy. But we all have to put it in context. And just as we have to be careful about misperceptions of the other side, we also have to be careful about misperceptions of misinformation. Here's the thing. Most people think that everyone is falling for misinformation when they learn that actually misinformation is smaller and that most people don't um, you know, believe misinformation, right. that actually hel helps them feel warmer and, and more likely to interact with the other side and more confident and trusting in democracy. So again, correcting perceptions and mispercep misperceptions is really the, 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 the end game I think we wanna to work towards here. I think you make such an excellent point because um, uh, it's about gaining perspective or re regaining perspective. Uh, and so much is about optics. And we know that politics is driven by optics and so much of media is driven by optics. Um, but really, I think what's a very important takeaway message for us that you're telling us is, this is about um, developing our powers of discernment. We need to be able to discern and becoming aware of the prism, like you say, having an experience that reveals it, uh, checking ourselves, understanding and gaining perspective. Hey, wait, this is not indicative of the majority of people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, in, and being committed to engagement. I think it was chilling that you said if moderate people start leaving, you know, platforms for discussion in droves, I mean, what, do, what are we, what is the result of that? I think that, boy, did that ever hit me in a certain way. Um, let me ask you, um, Janessa asks, where do you see us going as a society? Oh, and this is a very specific question. <laughs> this is a very broad question. Where do you see us going as a society? Do you see the use of social media intensifying along with this polarization or people burning out on, on it? <clears throat> I think that's a very real phrase, right? As we've seen with many people dropping off all their accounts, et cetera. I mean, I think you've touched on this, but do you have anything else to add? Because I think uh, people are so tired and exhausted that maybe this becomes a default question because it's a default concern. We get close to thinking we could be uh, engaged and have some agency, and then we go, forget it, it's impossible. But you're saying, no, it's not impossible at all. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, again, this is this is another you know question we'll all be talking about for some time to come. I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm an optimistic guy. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But let me tell you why I'm why I'm optimistic. Yeah. You know, if we first of all, we're early in the story of social media, right? It's only been around 10, maybe years, depending on how you, how you define social media in terms of how many people are using it. Right. Right. Um, and if we went back even 10 years, right, we'd, we'd be talking about Friendster and MySpace and the many other social media uh, sites that now litter the graveyard of, of, of you know, um, right. outmoded social media platforms, right? right? Even Facebook, you know, got so threatened by Instagram that it had to buy Instagram. And then, of course, Snapchat comes along and now TikTok and then Clubhouse and so on. So, you know, that churn, you know, is, is any one of these platforms going to take down Facebook's monopoly on the market anytime soon? I don't think so. But we're seeing the splintering of social media, right? You got Pinterest for hobbies, you got Strava for athletics, you got, you know, LinkedIn for business. And I think we'll see a real opportunity for some entrepreneur to create a space for discussions about politics. 
And I think, you know, not everybody's going to use it, right? Um, not everybody's going to want to, you know, like, like people like Patty, the woman I mentioned earlier, right? They're not, you know, jonesing to go, you know, talk about the latest, you know, Biden speech, right? right. But a lot of people are. And could we design a place there that allows that small but very important group of people, you might call them opinion leaders, they're the type of people who go tell their friends about what they should think about politics, right? How could we incentivize them to have more productive conversations? And right now, the incentives are all backwards, right? What gets you likes and new follows is being funny, taking down the other side, not producing messages that resonate with both sides. And so once again, you know, I think we could we could we could implement this tomorrow at the platform level. Right now, they are boosting posts that get a lot of engagement, they get a lot of likes, right? How do you get likes or comments? You just say something crazy, right? What if instead we boosted the messages that appeal to different types of people? We'd in that in that sense kind of optimize for democracy. We'd be trying to upvote or promote wow. the kind of the kind of message that really resonate with a lot of people. And taking you back to the lab for a minute here. Yes. Um, you know, well, well, we're waiting for platforms to try to figure that out. And by the way, we do in the polarization lab advocate with the platforms to make these kind of changes. So we're, we're working, we're working on it. You can, for example, check out our bipartisanship leaderboard. So here is a tool, uh, the app's taking a second to load here that Wait, will, Chris, um, can you, sorry to interrupt you. Can you make it bigger so we can read the type? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so this is a tool we, we rank, uh, politicians, uh, even celebrities and uh, advocacy groups and news organizations, they move higher up the leaderboard if their posts tend to get likes by both Republicans and Democrats, and they move lower down the ranking if they're only getting um, uh, likes from one side. So what this is doing, in effect, is trying to create a different kind of status, right? Right now, people are getting status for taking down the other side, right? What if you got status for bridging, for doing the kind of work that First Voice Amendment is doing? Then, you know, you create these structures, right? What if Twitter had verified badges for people who are, like, resolving conflict? You know, what if you created some kind of incentive structure that really did this? So, you know, is everybody going to come to the, bi the bipartisanship leaderboard on polarizationlab.com? Unfortunately, no. You know, we can get, we can do a little, you know, uh, you know, we can publish a piece in CNN or New York Times, and we get a little blip of attention. But how do you make it habit, right? Well, here's where our bots come in. So these two bots, which we call poly, automatically retweet messages from the people on either side who we know in our research shows that real Republicans and Democrats are both liking this content. So if you're on the left, you can follow the uh, con con conservative poly. If you're on the, on the right, you're, you can follow the liberal poly. And if you're kind of in between, you can follow both and try to you know, expose yourself to what we think is the middle of American politics. And it might kind of surprise you the type of stuff that, that, that comes on here, you know, stuff that really is and not always from the sources you expect, you know, sometimes it will be uh, CNN, you know, or sometimes it might be Fox News that's, that's um, you know, in there, even if most of their content isn't always so moderate. Um, so, you know, yeah, you can check out these tools and, you know, continue to advocate, you know, because uh, I think the thing is in the spirit of the question, right, it's like, yeah, I think you're right, Lou, everybody's exhausted. And so, you know, there's an appetite for something new you know nobody very few people say don't you just love facebook you know or don't you just love yeah. twitter no it's like we're, we use it but there could be something better and so that's what gives me hope um and we can use science and research to try to drive it and make it better um the platforms are trying you know I, it's it's awful the news coming out of facebook these days and, and how yeah. much deception there's been but at some point right through regulation through public pressure um, and business incentives too, you know, like Facebook will say, and whether we should believe them is a, is a real question right now, given how much, you know, damage and, and deception there's been, but they'll tell you, look, our advertisers also don't want content, their, their, their advertisements running alongside hate speech, you know, so um, if they could find a way to make everybody more positive, they, there's a market incentive there too. Yeah, well, I think your message about hope is so well received, um, I can imagine by all of us, it really lands with me. I think the pandemic has really accelerated this need for generative, people are looking for a way through, right? I just, I think it's almost like we've hit surge capacity just as a, as a human species of how much ambiguity and conflict we can tolerate. I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, this is, this is what's coming up for me. Um, Chris, your messages and the way you describe it, your your work, your book, um, 
the the field that you are um, enlivening for us to be able to really pay attention to are just really so powerful. So we really are very grateful. Um, Nell asks, what can we do as average folks to help magnify your messages? So your work is really resonating. So what can people do short of getting the book, which you've offered a discount, which they can find in the in the chat? Um, what can we do? What 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 is your ask of us? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, using the tools yourself. So become, you know, more reflective users yourselves. But, you know, tell your friends, please, you know, we are a small effort, you know, we are we are constantly trying to raise money and kind of, but we don't have the kind of media apparatus to make press releases and get we are grassroots, you know. And that's the thing that's great about technology and social media, right? The power of the crowd. When we when we share things, right, they can go viral. Um, so, you know, we would be so grateful if you share our tools, you know, maybe follow the bots, but then also start retweeting their messages that resonate with you and you know, explain to your followers, well, you know, I found out about this through this, um, you know, this uh, uh, polarization line. Um, you know, I think also um, we all need to think, you know, you, you know, you heard this old idea of vote with your wallet, you know, like back mm -hmm. in the day when we were all, you know, worried about uh, all sorts of corporations maybe or, or, you know, doing things we don't like, right, boycotts and so on. You need to vote with your like button now, you know, when you are logging on to social media, and let's say you're a Democrat and someone, you know, someone posts a, a picture of a cartoon of Trump or something like that. And you hit like, cause you think it's funny. Right. And you, that might seem totally innocuous to you and you're just blowing off steam, you know, like, well, what does it really mean? You know, like that's going to, that's actually going to believe it or not hurt someone's feelings, you know? Um, and yeah, you could say, yeah, I'm so mad. I'm, 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 I'm okay with that. Right. Like, but all of those actions, you know, what we share, what we like, um, what we engage with, right, are, are being tracked. And so vote with your like button, you know, vote with your newsfeed and, and um, you know, send the signal to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever social media you use yeah. that you don't like this device content, just ignore it. I think that's really powerful because First Amendment voice, you know, really advocates for people using their voice uh, in a way that um, that brings people together to appreciate differences, which sounds uh, like a straightforward uh, task uh, on paper, but as you have found out, and as we know at First, First Amendment Voice, it's complex. And so we, we try to enter into discussions. We, we do this with a symposium. Uh, by the way, all this content is on the YouTube channel for First Amendment Voice. Um, but Chris, I think I would love to end with, um, just this, this idea that really resonates so strongly, put ideas before identities. I think the ripple effect of that is that in um, collectively pursuing a different type of relational knowledge through this idea seeking, we create a different identity, maybe a truer identity. We maybe reclaim the identity that we, we have lost uh, by trying a million on for size and none feels uh, true. So I just wonder whether you could maybe speak to that and I'll, I'll weave into that question. One of our um, other questions at the end, Janessa asks, what drives your work and what, what maybe what's coming around the corner in terms of further research? Sure, thanks. I mean, I think so many of you are already doing it. You know, I want to I want to um, put the spotlight on Steve for a moment, but this work with you know helping Afghan refugees. I mean, you know, the number of people who would be surprised that there are any Republicans who care about Af Afghan refugees is staggering, right? And that's upsetting because we know that's just not the case of of, of so many people in the, in the center on the right and le center left, right? Um, but the idea that you know anyone who's not a, a Biden supporter would care at all about refugees, you know, it, it just sends, right, it sends the message, right? There's no, there's no identity there. There's no, oh, Biden did a bad job and that's why I have to do this now, right? It's just, no, this is an emergency. This is an all hands on deck. Um, let's show by example, you know, all the work that, that First Amendment Voice has done. And, and by the way, lots of other great organizations too. I'm sure you all have connections, Brave Angels and other groups that, you know, have, are really doing the hard work of deep polarization. By the way, um, you know, everything you do offline is super important. You know, yeah. I would never say, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna use technology, get our way all the way out of this, right? We are, we're, we are not, um, you, we're losing those in-person connections. And that's why techno fixing technology is so important. 
But the yes. research also says that all the hard work that all of you are doing each day is, is really paying off. Like those, those cross-party in-person conversations really seem to move the needle. So, you know, all I can do is take my hat off to you all and say, you know, like, um, you know, just just keep um, just keep these 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 exemplary, you know, um, cases, you know, um, uh, you know, boost them as, as, as far as you can on social media. You know, the other thing is if you share some posts about this conference and they don't get many likes, you know, um, that doesn't mean that people aren't seeing them. You know, that's the prism at work again, too. Right. The people doing all the liking and engaging are those extremists. So if you're not getting, you know, dozens of likes for your your latest post, it may still be impacting people. So put it out there. Um, get it out there. Yeah. That's such a great point. Yes. There's this myth of invisibility if you don't get all the likes, but that is so true. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. And you know, as far as what's around the corner, we are we are working on new studies. We're trying to peel back the layers of the onion of social media even more, looking at new features, studying different kinds of algorithms, doing, you know, trying to expand our tools. We're right now I'm working with some Duke students on a tool that will help Republicans and Democrats find opportunity to volunteer together. Um, you know, all sorts of ways that we can try to, again, translate research into action. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of that is on us academics. The problem is, you know, so many of us are, are happy to just live in, you know, an ivory tower. And, and, and again, it's an all hands on deck situation. So that's what motivates me. That's what, you know, led me to start this, this lab and, and to write this book. Just, you know, my genuine concern for my country and, and um, you know, wanted to contribute what I know, which is data science to, to try to start to, to, to turn the tide. But yeah, um, you know, it's been a pleasure. And, you know, thank you so much, uh, Lou, you, you know, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's such a rare thing for a journalist to really engage so deeply with a book. I mean, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to have to keep some of those things that, that you said, what was it? Um, objects in the mirror are larger than they appear. That's going to be my new line. <laughs> have at it. It's so, yours. So thank you. And, and um, thank you. This Steve and, and Sydney and Kusha for um, arranging the call. It's really, it's, it's been a, a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Well, I love that people are saying uh, they or just order the book, just order the book. Awesome. Um, so Polarization Lab, we, we need to get on uh, the website and start poking around and exploring the tools. This is very exciting. Share it with different people. The book is Breaking the Social Media Prism, How to Make Our Platforms Less Polarizing. And maybe the sub subtitle is And More Humanizing. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very, very much, Chris Bale. It has been an honor and we hope to have another conversation with you at some time. Um, Steve, on behalf of you, Steve Miska and all of the wonderful people who are behind putting this symposium together. It is no small feat. This is a beast to put together. So there are fantastic brains working behind the scenes. Um, this is the sixth annual symposium, the second virtual one. Steve, hopefully next year we will all be together and we will be with a whole bunch of people we've never met having fantastic discussions, still talking about Chris and maybe even with Chris. Uh, so, so that will be wonderful. Um, this has been a fantastic five days of discussions uh, with live audiences a lot of ideas that we've generated. Um, thank you everybody for watching, for being with us, for engaging, and please go to the YouTube channel because these videos will be up very shortly and we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much. Bye everybody.